The book of Mark in the New Testament is one of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, written accounts of the life of Jesus that give us an intimate look into his words and works. The Gospel of Mark was written just after the fire in Rome in 64 AD by John Mark, a close associate of Peter, the disciple of Jesus, an apostle of the early church. Rather than being a sequential account of the life and work of Jesus as the eyewitness accounts of Matthew and John or the collected accounts by Luke, the book of Mark is recognized as an arranged account from the preaching of Peter, who Mark served, listened to, and followed. Peter, who started as a fisherman and lived as both a denier and follower of Jesus, certainly held a unique perspective and experience in his relationship with one he would eventually give his life for. Explore with author and songwriter Michael Card the times and places Mark takes us into. Discover the passion and struggle of Christ's life it uniquely presents. Hope for the Gentiles, the Gospel of Mark, on this day of discovery. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. They're the first words out of Mark's mouth, the, the opening sentence of the Gospel of Mark. Someone has said it's the greatest sentence that's ever been written. Now, Paul used the word gospel, good news, over 80 times. But with the Gospel of Mark, this is a, a new literary form. It's the first time we have a gospel, a story that's based on confession. So the title of the book is also the table of contents. Two-part book, Mark. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, chapters one through eight end when Peter makes the confession, you're the Christ. Chapters nine through 15 end when of all people, a Roman soldier announces, surely this man is the Son of God. So a book that's based on confessing who Jesus is. Let me read to you another sentence. It was written in 9 BC. It's a birth announcement for someone who was born right on that hill behind me. Listen to these words and imagine how Mark's Roman readers would understand this. Since providence has set in most perfect order by giving us Augustus, sending him as savior, both for us and our descendants. And since the birthday of the God Augustus was the beginning of the good news, the gospel to the world. Do you see what Mark is doing in that opening sentence? He's announcing to this, to this Roman world, here we are in the Circus Maximus, he's announcing that a whole new world is coming. And Jesus cried out in a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the Son of God. If you want to really engage with the Gospel of John, it's good to go to Ephesus. That's where the Gospel of John was written. That's the context for the Gospel. If you want to read Matthew, it's good to go to Galilee. But if you really want to engage with the Gospel of Mark, this is the place to come to, Rome. That's where we are, right outside the Mamertine prison. Uh, behind us is the Forum. Uh, all around us are uh, these, these wonderful monuments. You can see the tourists uh, coming and going. Rome is the place to understand the Gospel of Mark. So let's begin by first asking, who, who is Mark? And the truth is, he is a, he's an incredible individual. To have written the first Gospel, he has the best credentials. Um, when Peter gets out of prison, uh, one of the third times Peter, Peter gets out of prison, he runs to Mark's house. Mark's house was essentially the first church. Uh, the Lord's Supper may have been uh, celebrated in Mark's house, okay? So very important. The church starts in his house, okay? We find out later in Acts that his cousin is Barnabas. Who's Barnabas? He's one of the first leaders of the early church, even before Paul. Barnabas is giving leadership uh, in the church. So the, the church meets in his house. Peter, someone like Peter, 
thinks that Mark's house is a good place to flee to. His cousin is Barnabas. And then because of his relationship with Barnabas, he travels with Paul in uh, the first couple of missionary journeys. It's Barnabas and Paul and Mark. Now at one point, Mark leaves. We don't know exactly why. Um, we can talk about that later. But one of the most important aspects of asking who is Mark is the fact that Mark has a close relationship with Peter. In 1 Peter, Peter refers to Mark as my son. So very, very close friendship. And in fact, we'll discover that the Gospel of Mark is actually the Gospel of Peter. Mark takes Peter's teaching on the life of Jesus and writes it down for the church. So we gotta ask this question uh, as we go down these steps to the Mamertine prison. We're gonna talk about Peter and Mark. I have written to you briefly exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. She who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. The Mamertine prison was originally built in the 6th century BC as a cistern to serve the needs for water in this Mediterranean country. But at some point, the Romans chose to use it instead as a prison, and it certainly would make an impression on those residing here. Here were the bleakest of conditions, a deep hole of dark, cold, unventilated stone, not only difficult physically, but I would think disturbing and dehumanizing mentally and emotionally. You can visit Mamertine and walk down into its lower chamber today where you'll find an altar commemorating the two apostles believed to be held here prior to their deaths, Paul, who was beheaded, and Peter, who was crucified. Mamertine was a prison built for high-profile offenders of Rome, and certainly Peter and Paul qualified in that day. We're entering a chapel that's above the Mamertine prison. This is an ancient site. Uh, worship has gone on here for centuries. In fact, you can see on the walls ancient um, images that are, that are all falling apart. Here, though, is, is the actual hole that goes down into the holding cell. Uh, we'll go down there in a minute. It's, it's, not, it's not a very uh, comfortable place to be. But originally, this was the only way to get down there. Um, uh, Paul would have been simply dropped down this hole, uh, food, provisions. And if Peter indeed was here, uh, he would have been dropped through this hole. And if he wasn't here, he was a place very like this because persecution has become a reality. Okay, Very important in understanding the Gospel of Mark. But if Peter is Mark's source, then you would expect Peter's fingerprints to be all over the Gospel of Mark. And that's exactly, exactly what you find. Mark is a very emotional gospel. Jesus is very emotional in the gospel of Mark. And, and if that's uh, a result of Peter, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, the other gospels use very few adjectives. Uh, John only uses four or five. Matthew, Mark used seven, six, seven adjectives to describe the emotional life of Jesus. Mark uses 16. And it's so much shorter than those other gospels. Only in the Gospel of Mark do we see Jesus actually holding children in his arms. Very emotional. Um, only in Mark does Jesus talk about the fact that all foods are now clean. I think that's a reflection of Peter. But the, I think the main indication of Peter's influence is there's this urgency. It's emotional. It's urgent. It's always moving along. Immediately is, is Mark's favorite word. It happens 11 times in chapter 1 alone. Immediately Jesus did this. They went from this place to that place. There's this earnest urgency that's always happening in the Gospel of Mark. That's because suffering is becoming a reality in the church. Suffering that was experienced in a holding cell in a dark place like this. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure is at hand. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. So Mark 
is a, is a pamphlet for hard times. It's, it's written after the fire in Rome to prepare uh, his readers for the prospect of suffering. Now we're here in the Mamertine prison. Uh, there's, a, there's a good chance that Paul was here. We're not so sure if Peter was here or not, but he would have been held in a place like this. So this is a good, part, uh, a good place to talk about Peter. Um, it's very uncomfortable. I have claustrophobia, and uh, there's something in me that wants to run back up the stairs right now. There's, there's water standing. You can imagine the prisoners in the dark drinking from uh, uh, a little puddle of water. Uh, it, it's a very claustrophobic place. But it helps us to understand that this was the context for early Christians. After the persecution begins, after the fire, uh, Peter and Paul are both caught up in that persecution and both uh, uh, eventually lose their lives. And there's a wonderful uh, hint. You have to read closely to find it, but it's in, it's in 1 Peter. 1 Peter is really two letters. Um, in in, in, in um, 411, there's a nice ending. Um, Praise be uh, uh, to God who provides us with all things. Um, may God be praised through Jesus Christ. To Him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Now doesn't that sound like the ending of a letter to you? It's a nice letter where there's this distant prospect of suffering. But listen carefully. Next verse, 412. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial, and some translations say, at the fiery trial you are suffering. Something has happened between verses 11 and 12. And I'm convinced that what happened was the fire in Rome, because Peter goes on to talk about suffering. The word suffering, I've underlined it 10 or 15 times. Uh, he's using code language. Uh, he talks about the devil prowls around like a roaring lion. That's Nero. In, in 2 Timothy, uh, Paul refers to uh, the, uh, the lion uh, being delivered from the lion's jaws. That's Nero, code language. And he, he even refers to Rome as Babylon. Those, uh, she who is in Babylon, that's a code word for Rome. It's also used in Revelation as a code word. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends her greetings, and so does my son Mark. So that's the connection, Peter with Mark, Peter giving his testimony about the life of Jesus, all wrapped up in the context of suffering. The prospect of suffering has become a reality, and there in the midst, writing this all down, is Peter's close little brother in the faith, Mark. Be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless, and consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. This is the Circus Maximus. It sits in a valley just below Palatine Hill where the Caesars of Rome ruled and lived and enjoyed the best view of the circus. It was the first and largest arena in the empire for chariot races and many other kinds of mass entertainment. If we're gonna interact with the Gospel of Mark, in the city of Rome, believe it or not, this big open field is the most important spot. This was the Circus Maximus, the largest wooden structure ever, ever in the history of the world. All the way around this long track. Now, originally it, it seated 200,000 people before the fire, 200,000 people. After the fire, they rebuilt it enlarged it to 300,000 people. There are basically two, two, two festivals in, uh, in the Roman calendar where the everyday man could, could celebrate, could uh, look forward. Think of uh, Super Bowl. They both happened in July. The first one was early in July. It was dedicated to the god Apollo. But the second started on the 20th of July it was dedicated to Venus and it celebrated Caesar's uh, victories, okay? It was a, a long festival that concluded with three days of chariot races, three days when the hundreds of thousands of people would come to this place. They would watch uh, chariot teams of varying size, two horse teams, four horse teams, believe it or not, 10 horse teams, 
a chariot with 10 horses pulling it, four teams doing seven laps around this huge stadium, 200,000 people screaming at the top of their lungs. I mean, it's, 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 it's the Super Bowl. It's the Super Bowl. Okay, what happens? On the 19th of July, they're, they're, uh, they're raking the sand, they're preparing for this, this festival, and a fire breaks out. It breaks out right over there where the new excavations are. If you can see that stonework, there was a stone foundation that went all the way around the Circus Maximus and the wooden seating was built on top of that. The fire began there on the 19th, on the 19th, and it very quickly set this entire wooden structure, the largest wooden structure ever built in the world, this whole area was on fire. Then the fire went up the Palatine Hill, went that way, burned, practically the whole city was destroyed. This is very important, believe it or not, if you're gonna understand the Gospel of Mark, because what happened is after the fire was put out, people began to blame Nero, the Emperor Nero. We need to get into his mind later on. But the, the, the historian Tacitus tells us that Nero very quickly decided that he needed to find a scapegoat. That's the word that Tacitus used. Uh, Nero had, had voluntarily cleaned up the site. He had lowered the cost of grain. He had done a, done a number of things to win the people's favor back. But everyone realized, everyone decided that Nero had set that fire. He wanted to clear out the slum areas, build himself a larger house. He wanted to rename the city Neronius after himself. So the people start to blame Nero. And he decides that he's going to blame the Christians. That's when Christian persecution began. When a fire started in that corner, July 19th, 64 AD. That's when per persecution became a reality. And that's the immediate context for the Gospel of Mark. The Garden of Messinus was an extraordinary place we cannot exactly locate in Rome. It contained gardens, terraces, baths, and libraries. It was a cultural gathering place that also held statues and items of Roman culture from the Augustan age. Here we are in a, an ordinary park in the middle of Rome. But when you learn to use your imagination, there really, there's no such thing as an ordinary place. We, we, we went to the Circus Maximus, we saw where the fire started, and we, we've talked a lot about uh, the impact of the, the fire of Rome on the Gospel of Mark. But I wanted to come here, to this spot in particular, to get into Nero's mind a little bit, because I think this is important. Nero becomes emperor when he's, he's only 17 years old, it's 54 AD. He has led a life, well, the, the word spoiled doesn't even describe it. He's had everything he wanted his entire life. And now at 17, he's the most powerful man in the world. And it, his mind is pretty twisted. His mind is very twisted. He has a few uh, responsible years when he's a young man as an emperor. He has uh, Seneca as an advisor who is a, a very honorable man. But then pretty soon Nero realizes that he can do whatever he wants to do and he decides he wants to build a golden house, a house that's going to cover a third of the city. And that's why he started the fire. All of the ancient historians agree on this. He, he begins the fire to clear a part of the city to build his house. But this is why we're here. The fire begins on the 19th of July. Nero doesn't come back till the 21st. He waits three days and he comes to this place. Now, in, in ancient times, this was an area known as the Gardens of Messinus. It was the most beautiful garden in Rome. Uh, Messinus had been a friend of Augustus, and he had willed this beautiful, uh, enormous garden to uh, his friend Augustus. Well, Nero comes up here because the fire had, hadn't reached this point. He comes up here. He goes up on top of a third story building. He doesn't fiddle while Rome burns, like the, the story says. The fiddle hadn't been invented yet. But he comes, he stands on top of a thir third story building. He overlooks the city. And we're told that he, he comments on how beautiful the flames are. I mean, thousands of people dying, the city all aflame. Nero's interested in how beautiful the flames are. 
But this is, this is where I want us to engage with our imaginations. It, it, was, it was at this point, I believe, that Nero realized his plan has gone terribly wrong. And he's going to have to find someone to blame. So follow me, if you can, in, in, in a sense, in, in, and I'm using my imagination, but it could be said that Christian persecution began in a very ordinary place like this, when a twisted person like Nero decides he's going to have to find a, a scapegoat, someone to blame the fire on. That leads to Christian persecution. That leads to Peter and Paul in prison. And that leads to the Gospel of Mark. It seems a little redundant to say, this is the wilderness, I mean, this is it. At some point, we don't know what point, or what, what triggered Jesus to let him know it was time, but at some point, he realizes that it's time to go. And he, he makes a 10 day to two week foot trip down the Jordan Valley to where John the Baptist is baptizing. Now, he goes into the water, we, we all know the story, John baptizes him. There's not a lot of detail in Mark, but the, the Holy Spirit descends as a dove. And Jesus hears at the beginning of his ministry the words that every daughter, every son long and need to hear from their father. I love you and I'm well pleased with you. Those words are going to sustain Jesus for the rest of the ministry. Very important though, that the spirit that descends then drives, Mark says, the spirit drives Jesus here to the wilderness. He's here for 40 days and 40 nights, although I don't think Mark even gives us that detail. He doesn't give us the detail of Satan tempting Jesus, the stones to bread business. That's not in Mark. But Mark gives us two details that are unique. He tells us, first of all, that when Jesus was here in the wilderness, he was with the wild beasts and that angels attended him. If you remember that Mark was written for Christians in Rome who were suffering persecution, you realize that one of those forms of persecution was to be thrown to wild animals in the arena. Mark wants his readers to know that they aren't going to experience any kind of suffering that Jesus hasn't already experienced, no kind of temptation that Jesus hasn't already experienced. But he also wants his readers to know that when they are with the wild beasts, that angels are going to be present too, that though they may not see them, angels are going to be present with them to attend to them. One of the scenes of the Bible that has brought strength to many is Jesus walking on the water. We often recall the scene of him sleeping on the boat in the storm and calming the sea. But far more subtle and yet quietly powerful is this scene given to us by Mark, who had heard it from one who had been in the boat on that occasion. Jesus had just spoken to a great multitude and performed a miracle of providing loaves and fishes to feed the people. Mark chapter 6, verses 45 through 51. He made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night he came to them walking on the sea and would have passed them by. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he went up into the boat to them, and the wind ceased. And they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled. Yes, he calmed the sea and their hearts. But we will discover as we continue with Mark that following Jesus is going to be frightening. 
and wonderful. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Sea of Galilee, it's amazing to be able to come to the actual spot where Jesus spoke his very first words, his very first words in the Gospel of Mark were really his sermon, fairly simple sermon. Um, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is near, repent and believe in the good news. That's, that's his message, it's just that simple, just that, that focused. And it's important to realize that he begins to preach before he calls anyone. He doesn't need them. I mean, it's a privilege that the 12 are invited to become a part of what he's doing. But immediately after he begins to preach is when he calls Peter. Now we're in Mark. We know that Peter is the source of Mark. And so guess who the first disciple to be called is? Peter, walking along this very, very shoreline. He uses a word that uh, is, is, it only appears one time in the gospel. There's a big word for it. It's called a hapax legomena. That's your big word for the day. It means it just appears once. But it's the technical fishing term for casting. Peter's casting his nets. And Jesus comes, beautiful, imaginative uh, figure of speech. Come follow me and you'll catch people. From now on, you're going to be catching people. Now you've heard that in a thousand sermons. It's almost cozy, right? You think, what, a, what an interesting thing for Jesus to say. And the disciples look up from their nets and, and uh, their hearts are warmed. And, uh, and if you've imagined it that way, then you've gotten it completely wrong. It's not a cozy scene. It's ominous. Let's think about this for a second. Jesus has just come back from the wilderness, from the temptation, where Mark tells us he was with the wild beasts. He's just discovered that his cousin John has been put in prison by Herod and it doesn't take much of an imagination to realize John's not going to live much longer. And even that term, fishers of men, uh, if you spend any time with Jesus, you, you learn that everything that comes from his mouth comes from the Old Testament and that's a quote from Jeremiah, Jeremiah 16, 16. It's a judgment passage. God says, uh, I, will, I will call them and uh, many fishers and they will, they will catch them. It's a judgment motif. And so this isn't a cozy scene. It's, it's an ominous moment, the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And the call, follow me, is not an invitation. It's a command. Behold, I will send for many fishermen, says the Lord, and they shall fish them. And afterward, I will send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and every hill and out of the holes of the rocks. For my eyes are on all their ways. They are not hidden from my face, nor is their iniquity hidden from my eyes. It's a glorious day. The North End of the Sea of Galilee. I mean, just take in the sweep of that beautiful lake. Gives you an idea of the scale. Um, this is the perfect place to talk about one of the uniquenesses of uh, the Gospel of Mark, which I think is another indication of the fact that Peter is Mark's source. Remember, uh, Mark writes down uh, what Peter has to say. And it has to do with the fact that from the very first chapter, the ministry is out of control. Now, what do I mean when I say that? What I mean is that Jesus is constantly covered up with people. And it happens in chapter one. Jesus heals, of all people, Peter's mother-in-law. 
And as a result, in, in the evening, Mark tells us the whole town gathers. Now, Capernaum is just a mile down the lake. We're, we'll go there next, and we'll see how narrow the alley, alleyways are. And when you imagine the whole town gathered uh, all around Peter's house, I mean, people are cutting holes in the roofs of buildings to get to Jesus. Only in Mark, Jesus says, have a boat ready so they don't push me into the lake. It's already out of control. He's covered up. That early message that we heard down by the seashore, his, his basic uh, a message that he's preaching, that's what he wants to do. So what happens? Early in the morning, he comes uh, very likely to this place. And we're about a mile from Capernaum on, a, on the top of this beautiful ridge. It's before the sun has even come up. And Peter and the disciples look for him, and they finally find him up here in the wilderness. And Peter says, everyone is looking for you. And Jesus says, let's go somewhere else so I can preach. And the rest of the Gospel of Mark, he's crisscrossing this lake, uh, going all the way to Tyre to get away from the crowd. Because the crowd, they don't want to hear that simple message, that simple four-part message. They want his gifts. They want to be fed. They want to be healed. And Jesus is a very reluctant celebrity. He wants to have nothing to do with it. Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him, and saying to him, If you're willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus, moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him, and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. Then a man with a serious skin disease came to him and on his knees begged him, If you're willing, you can make me clean moved with compassion. That's our first little window into his emotional life. Jesus moved with compassion, reached out his hand and touched him. I am willing, he told him, be made clean. Immediately, and there's Mark's favorite word, immediately the disease left him and he was healed. Now that's a nice, succinct story, but it goes on and here's where it gets confusing. In fact, Matthew and Luke both leave this part of the story out. Then he, that's Jesus, sternly warned him and drove him away, sent him away, but it could be translated, drove him away. Jesus' emotional state completely changes. He sternly warned him and drove him away, telling him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer what Moses prescribed for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Yet, he, the leper, went out and began to proclaim it widely and to spread the news with the result that Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but he was out in deserted places and they would come to him from everywhere. Now that's just chapter one. But Mark wants to show us the, the complexity of Jesus' emotion. He, he sees a leper, he, he smells the leper coming and he's moved with compassion. That's the Jesus we all recognize. But then he sees the skin clearing, he, the, the smell begins to vanish, and Jesus begins to realize what this is gonna mean for his ministry, and his mood changes. Now he's not angry at the beggar, at the leper. He's angry at the situation uh, of which he has no control. So he sternly warns him, don't tell anyone, and he drives him away. But how can, how can you keep quiet about such a miracle? And so the leper begins to tell everyone, and what Jesus feared the most is exactly what happens. He is covered up once more with people who just want his gifts, they don't want to listen to what he has to say, and he's, he's driven out into the wilderness. Now this, this scene in the first chapter of Mark, it's, it's not the Jesus of my imagination, the cozy Jesus, Jesus meek and mild that I grew up with, I don't, I don't like him sternly warning and driving people away. I don't like it when he says later in the gospel, how much longer do I have to put up with you? But, but Mark doesn't want Jesus to be just a figment of my imagination. He wants me to know the Jesus of the gospels, the Jesus of Peter's life, the Jesus whose emotional life was complicated and, and, and beyond anyone's understanding. 
Jesus could no longer openly enter the city, but was outside in deserted places. And they came to him from every direction. It's a busy place up here. You're gonna hear cars and trucks going by almost constantly. We don't like to think of Galilee this way. We want it to be quiet and pastoral. But the truth is, this is how it was when Jesus was teaching. It was the most populated part of Palestine, very crowded, lots of people, a very strategic place to begin a ministry. And as Peter recounts to Mark what it was like being with Jesus, Peter remembers being discipled by Jesus. And we only get this in the Gospel of Mark. It begins when Jesus calls them, calls the 12, and he designates them apostles. And that simply means sent ones. They're the ones he would send. And then a series of stories follows in the next three or four chapters where Jesus is discipling his disciples. Now it begins with a little detail. It doesn't sound like much when you read it, but it, it's very important. It's the bookend. Mark loves to use bookends. He makes the, the point in chapter three that so many people are coming and going that they didn't even have a chance to eat. Now that doesn't sound like an important detail, but it is, so remember that. The very next thing that happens is Jesus' mother and brothers come and they decide that Jesus is out of his mind because he's not eating. So many people are coming and going. That's the first story. And the disciples see Jesus' conflict with his own family. Then the, the priests say that Jesus is demon-possessed and the disciples hear that, they're with him. Then Jesus tells the seed parables in chapter four, parables about what they're about to do. They're gonna go out and, and sow the seed, just like the, the, the man in the parables. And so he disciples his disciples. He explains these parables to them in private, and it's the only time he will ever do that. Finally, he shows his power over disease and death, over the demonic, and he goes to Nazareth and he's rejected, and his disciples are all there experiencing that. This is very important as he prepares to send them out, and he finally does. When they come back in chapter six, they report back it's been a successful uh, mission. And Jesus says to them, now go with me to a quiet place up into these hills so that we can get some rest. And there, the, the bookend happens again. They go up into the hills, they turn around, and there are 5,000 people. And the detail is given, there are so many people coming and going that they don't even have a chance to eat. We're up on a high ridge overlooking the southern end of the Sea of Galilee. Since we spend most of our time on the northern end of the lake because Capernaum's up there, but now we're down here because there's another story, an important story that happened uh, on this part of the lake. But you can see the very end of the, of the Sea of Galilee right there. We're standing amidst a bunch of ruins. This is the city of Hippos, which is one of the Decapolis, one of the 10 cities, pagan cities that were on this side of the lake. Uh, but interestingly, Jesus comes here, comes to this pagan area. Um, the thing that brought him here at this point was uh, the first big storm, uh, a storm that happened right down here on the Sea of Galilee. Um, it was a storm unlike any storm the disciples had ever seen. They'd grew, grown up on this lake. They knew what storms could be like, but they'd never seen anything like this. And I think Mark wants us to understand that this storm was a demonic storm because this storm prepares us for Jesus coming here to this area to, to, to see the gathering demoniac. So I want you to understand the first storm in chapter four, this demonic shaking, Matthew calls it, to, calls it a shaking, was really a demonic attack on Jesus and the disciples. I also believe it was demonic because Jesus says to the storm what he always says to demons. He stands up and he says, be muzzled and the storm dies down. And there, there are other elements of the story of the gathering demoniac, I think, that connected to this story. So let's see this, not as an individual story, but all uh, connected. There's a flow that I think is very important. Mark tells the story using three terms, and that's what the story's all about as far as I'm concerned. The storm happens, and he says there was a great wind, okay? A great wind. And then when Jesus speaks be muzzled. Mark tells us there was a great calm. And then 
the, the order is everything. At the end, with the, amongst the disciples, Mark says, there was a great fear. The, the, the great fear doesn't come because of the storm. The great fear comes because of the disturbing presence of Jesus and this unbelievable power. I'm working on a song right now. One of the lines is, a great, a great wind, a great calm, a great fear. An unbelievable power is here. Far beyond the darkness and the waves, there is a very real reason to be afraid. Chapter 5 of Mark is a masterpiece. We meet three people, three people who have absolutely nothing in common but one thing. They all fall at Jesus' feet. That's his literary theme that pulls all these people together. Now the first one is the, the Gadarene demoniac. This happened just down the hill from where we are right now. Uh, remember there was a, this, a demonic storm that, that blew Jesus and his disciples to this place. And I want you to see this is a continuation of that same story. They get out of the boat and here comes this man and he is the poster child for demonic possession. He is extraordinary strength. They have tried to bind him with chains and he breaks them. He cuts himself with stones. He lives in the tombs. Um, this man is a serious, uh, seriously demonically possessed person. Uh, when Jesus approaches him, um, th the demons in him start to plead that Jesus, uh, don't torture me. And for the first time I've realized that maybe they're referring to that storm. They, they try to kill Jesus and the disciples in the storm. He lands on the beach and the demonic uh, presence there is afraid. Don't torture me. See? Um, and then they begin to beg, please, you know, don't, don't, uh, don't destroy us, send us into the pigs. Now we know uh, this is a Gentile area because you had a herd of pigs and in Judaism, pigs were unclean. So we're clearly in this Gentile area. Isn't it interesting that they have to ask permission from Jesus? Jesus has absolute authority, absolute power. Jesus asked the, the demon uh, its name. He responds, legion. Now, legion is a Roman military term. It means from three to 6,000 people. But I hear this as, as, as another threat. The demon is kind of uh, insinuating that Jesus may be outnumbered. Three to 6,000, you know, this is, a, this is a threatening move. After the storm, uh, you know, after, after Jesus' confrontation uh, with the demon, now he's trying to scare him. Even when the pigs run into the water, these dead pigs floating on the water, I think that's part of the threat. It's almost as if, you know, they're saying, you know, what happened to those pigs? is what could have happened to you. But Jesus obviously isn't afraid, afraid of any of this. Any of this. Uh, he, he speaks the word and the man is delivered of, of the demons. The people from town come in and they find him dressed in his right mind and, and sitting at Jesus' feet. Again, Jesus' absolute authority. But what we would come to expect from Mark is exactly what happens. The people are afraid. The disciples were afraid of Jesus' power on the storm, and now the people see Jesus' effect on this man, and they're afraid, and they ask Jesus to leave. Now, the man who's been uh, delivered of these demons begs to go with Jesus. You would think that this would be a, a good guy to have as a disciple. This is a great testimony he's got, but Jesus won't let him go. He hasn't been called. He's not part of this original plan of the 12. But he does say, go back home and tell everyone what the Lord has done for you. Now that, we should come to see that as an unusual thing in Mark, because what does Jesus usually say? He usually says, don't tell anybody what I did. He tells this man, go, tell them how much the Lord has done for you. Now they're gonna be coming back into this region in chapter seven, and guess what? When they come back, there's a large crowd that's waiting to meet Jesus. So that's the first person in chapter five who finds deliverance at Jesus' feet is the demoniac. And we have two more to look at. Mark really wants us to get the feeling of Jesus and the disciples crisscrossing the lake, going in back and forth. So after the story of the demoniac, 
the people of the town ask Jesus to leave, and he does. I mean, he doesn't want to stay where he's not wanted. He crosses back to a point that Mark doesn't tell us where it is. In fact, none of the Gospels do. He finds a man there named Jairus. So it feels to me like it may be Capernaum because Mark knows the name of the person there, but that's just, that's just a guess. But they land at Capernaum, I'll say, and another person falls at his feet. It's Jairus. He's the synagogue ruler. He has responsibilities at the synagogue. And he's desperate. His daughter is dying. And without a word, Jesus leaves. He's on his way to Jairus' house to heal this little girl. Then there's one of Mark's bookends. Uh, that's the bookend. And then, then there's the story of the woman who, in the crowd, slips in behind Jesus. Again, there's always this mob of people. They're waiting for him beside the lake. And she slips in behind Jesus and she thinks magically, she thinks, oh, if I touch him, that will heal me. So she reaches out, she touches the hem of Jesus' garment and she's healed and then she disappears because she's afraid. She's afraid knowing that she's rendered Jesus unclean. You see, she's been bleeding, uh, vaginal bleeding for 12 years. She's anemic. Uh, she's been cut off from her community because she's unclean. She's uh, spend all her money on doctors and the medical cures for this condition were ridiculous. One of them was that you would take uh, uh, grains of oat out of the cattle dung and make people drink it as a cure. I mean, that's the sort of thing she's been suffering for all these years. So she reaches out, she touches Jesus. Now you would think that that would be enough, but for Jesus it isn't. Uh, the miracle of her healing is not enough. He doesn't want to just give her healing, he wants to give her himself. So the real miracle is that he looks for, intently he looks for her and he finds her. And she's the third person. She falls at his feet. So we've had the demoniac, we've had Jairus, and now the third person, this woman. She falls at his feet. And she's afraid because she thinks she's about to get a stern lecture having rendered him unclean and that's not what she gets at all. Jesus says, daughter. And this is the only time in the gospel he calls someone that. It's a very tender term daughter, he says, your faith has healed you. So it's a wonderful little vignette. But at that point, the story really turns dark. Someone comes from Jairus' house and they say, his little girl has died. Bad news. This, this delay has been catastrophic, right? And what they say has so much meaning. So let's listen closely and ask ourselves, when, when the people from Jairus' house say, don't bother Jesus anymore because she's dead. What does that imply? Well, it implies that they believe he can heal her when she's sick, but now that she's dead, there's nothing he can do, right? No one can raise people from the dead. And at that point, Jesus whispers something to Jairus. You know, don't be afraid, just believe is how it's usually translated. I have my own translation that's much simpler, I think a little more uh, literary. And I whisper this to myself all the time. It can be translated, no fear, just faith literally, no fear, just faith. So they make their way to Jairus' house. Now this would be a great uh, public miracle, wouldn't it? I mean, to raise someone from the dead and get a, you know, a bunch of publicity going for yourself, but that's not, not, not how Jesus' ministry works. Peter, James, and John and the parents go into a, a room probably about this size, and he says, little girl, get up. And it's, it's Aramaic again, Talitha kum, Jesus. We get to hear Jesus' own voice, and she gets up because Jesus has redefined death. Now it's just sleep. It's just something he's gonna wake you up from. He's gonna wake us up from someday. She gets up and she's healed. Three people come to Jesus. Three people fall at his feet. Uh, a, a, a demoniac who's, who's out of his mind. Uh, a, a, a woman who's dying, who's literally bleeding to death. A desperate father who has no hope. And what do they find? They find they find clarity, they find hope, they find healing, they find life. All those same things are still waiting for us at the feet of Jesus. And he said to them, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going and they did not even have time to eat. So they departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. But the multitudes saw them departing, and many knew him and ran there on foot from all the cities. They arrived before them 
and came together to him. In chapter 6, at the end of chapter 6 in Mark, we have the feeding of the 5,000. It happened right around here. And it's not hard to imagine if you see these large open spaces just up from the Sea of Galilee, which is how Mark describes the spot. It's one of those unmiraculous miracles of Jesus. Uh, he does it in a very unmiraculous way. He simply says the blessing and feeds 5,000 people. Afterwards, they pick up 12 little lunch pail sized baskets of crumbs. That's the real miracle that his disciples are perfectly provided for. Um, but that's not what I wanna talk about. I wanna encourage you to read big blocks of scripture, not simply a, a couple of verses, but whole chapters, maybe even two or three chapters at a time. If you'll do that, you'll be able to see this kind of detail. Because in chapter six, if you read the whole chapter, you see that there are two, cha there are two banquets in chapter six, two banquets in chapter six. The first one takes place miles from here, down by the Dead Sea in one of Herod's palaces. It's very luxurious. We know about Salome, the dancing girl, and that, that banquet ends in the death of John the Baptist. That's the first part of chapter six, but then the second part of chapter six, we have another banquet here on a hillside with just fish and bread. It's not a powerful king, it's a servant who's come to be the shepherd and to care for and to feed his people and to give them just what they need. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he sent the multitude away. This is a place I have always wanted to see. I've longed to come to this place, and uh, this is my first time to see it. On a beautiful day, uh, this is a, quite a moment for me. We're in Bethsaida. This is where Peter was born. Peter was born here. Andrew, James, John, this was their hometown. So uh, kind of an important place in terms of the Bible. Um, from where I'm standing, I can see the Sea of Galilee. Uh, I can sort of see part of Capernaum. Uh, there's a whole sweep of the history of, of the Bible and New Testament in particular. Just, I can see from just standing here, it's a, <laughs> I'm a, I'm a little speechless and that doesn't often happen to me. Jesus loved parables. Matthew goes so far as to say he never taught anything except he'd use a parable to teach it. So parables are very important to Jesus, right? Um, but I hate parables because they force you to think. I mean, I want an outline, you know, give me everything all digested, didactic, let a, let a professor all write it out for me. Let me read an article. That is not how Jesus teaches. Not then and not now. He teaches in parables. And I want to talk about two healings that are actually parables at the same time. I mean, they actually happened, but they were teaching healings. I don't know if you've ever heard anything like that. The first one happened just down the, the lake from here, uh, and it has all the mark and uh, unique signs. Jesus heals the man and tells him not to tell anyone. Jesus is very emotional. He sighs deeply. That's unique in Mark. He speaks his native language. Uh, when, he, when he opens the man's ears, he shouts out in Aramaic, you know, be open, ephaphtha. But it, it, it's, it's a deaf man who's brought to Jesus to be healed. But what's different about this miracle is how Jesus uh, performs it, which lets you know something's going on. Because we've seen that he's usually very unmiraculous when he, he does miracles. He, he bless, blesses the bread and feeds 5,000 people. You know, he'll tell the lepers, go, and as, you, as they go, they're healed. Very unmiraculous. Sometimes he's not even there when he does the miracle. So when, when you see Jesus being open and shouting and sticking his finger in his ears and doing all this business, you've got to stop and think something's up. He's making a point. He's trying to teach us something in this miracle. But it's a bookend, just like Mark loves, loves to use these bookend devices. That healing is a bookend. But the second healing, which I want to take a little more time to look at, 
uh, happened just outside of town, just outside of Bethsaida. And so let's go outside of town to talk about that miracle. It's chapter eight in Mark, and Jesus and the disciples are on the move again. They cross the lake again. Remember in Mark, they're always crisscrossing the lake, getting away from the mob. This time they're getting away from the Pharisees. And they come here to Bethsaida. Once they get into town, they bring a blind man to Jesus. This is the other bookend. Remember the first bookend is that unusual dramatic healing of the deaf man. This is going to be another unusual healing, a healing that's a parable. They bring the blind man to Jesus and they beg him to heal him, which of course Jesus is gracious and compassionate. He always does. So he spits, he lays his hand on the man, and then he says, do you see? Which is a little unusual. But the man's response is really unusual. He says, I see people like trees walking around. I mean, I can, I can recreate that for myself. I see people like trees walking around. Now that should bother you. I mean, did, did Jesus not use enough power? Did he not use enough spit? I mean, this is com a completely unique miracle that only Mark tells us. But there's a point, remember, this miracle is also a parable. Jesus touches the man again and he sees perfectly. It's a bookend. One man who's deaf, another man who's blind. So you have to ask the question, what's in between the bookend? And what's be between the bookends is a long expose of the fact that the disciples aren't getting it. They aren't seeing, they aren't hearing. So Jesus enacts these two parables to sort of flesh out the reality of the disciples' experience. Now Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And on the road he asked his disciples, saying to them, Who do men say that I am? This is Caesarea Philippi. This is the headwaters of the Jordan. And up on that hillside, in that cliff, you see the cave of Pan. In fact, there was, a, there was a whole row of temples. This is a very pagan place. Uh, the Cave of Pan with a temple in front of it that's no longer there. There was a, a, a temple to Augustus. They, they worshiped dancing goats. Later on, there was a temple to Zeus. This is a very pagan place. And it's 25 miles from Galilee up to here. Jesus brings his disciples to this place to ask them a very important question. And you gotta ask yourself why. Why would they come all this way and honestly, in terms of, in, in Jesus' mind, I don't understand why. But for Mark, and for Mark's Roman readers, it, it makes perfect sense that the confession that Jesus is the Messiah should take place in the midst of pagan temples because Mark's readers are gonna be confessing Jesus in, in this sort of place. Jesus asked two questions. Uh, who do people say that I am? Second question, who do you say that I am? Now, Peter, uh, all of a sudden, Jesus and Peter are the only people on the stage. Remember, the Gospel of Mark is Peter's testimony. Peter doesn't really even answer Jesus' question. Jesus says, who do people say I am? He doesn't say, we say you are. Peter simply says, you're the Christ. He's speaking out of revelation. He's speaking more than he knows. And in Matthew, he's blessed for that. Jesus pronounces this beautiful blessing. Mark leaves the blessing out. Jesus begins to undeceive them. That, by that I mean he begins to explain to them what the Messiah really means, that the Messiah is the person who's going to die, not come reign as a king, but he's going to die for the people. Peter takes him aside and says, it'll never happen to you. And then Jesus curses Peter. Basically, he says, get thee behind me, Satan. You're not speaking the things of God, but the things of men. Mark includes the curse but he leaves out the blessing. And I think that's another indication that we have the testimony of, of Peter here. So now Jesus has to begin to explain to them what it means to really be the Messiah. And that's gonna happen as they journey back, back towards Jerusalem, where we're gonna hear the second confession. Remember Mark is a two-part gospel from verse one, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, part two. So. 
part one ends right here at Caesarea Philippi when Peter speaks those fateful words. From this point on, we're moving towards the second confession that's gonna come from the lips of a Roman soldier of all people who's gonna speak those words, surely this is the Son of God, in front of a cross. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. This is a high place ab above Caesarea Philippi where the confession happened. Very important to understand that Peter's confession happens first and then the transfiguration because what happens is after it's established that Jesus is the Messiah, he, he uh, strictly charges the disciples not to tell anyone, to keep it a secret because he's gonna teach them what the Messiah means. Then they come up on this high mountain he just takes Peter, James, and John with him. And something remarkable happens. I mean, you've probably heard the story. Uh, two people appear with Jesus, Moses and Elijah. They're the only other prophets that ever went up to Sinai and talked to God, Moses and Elijah. And they're talking with Jesus. Jesus becomes uh, luminous. Uh, Peter, in a very homespun way, says he's, he was whiter than anyone could bleach clothes. It's a very uh, countryfied sort of way of describing this luminous person. And then God speaks. This is my son, listen to him. Now the context of this is, is fear. You don't understand this story until you understand that Peter and, and James and John are terrified. I mean, you're, a, you're a, a good Jewish man. You find yourself on the top of a mountain with Moses and Elijah and a brilliant light. Peter's terrified and so he asks, Rabbi, is it good for us to be here? Let me build three shelters and those shelters are for protection. He wants to protect himself from uh, this light that might even kill him. But at that point, God provides the protection and uh, clouds, like <laughs> these incredible clouds, a cloud comes down and covers them. And added to the confession of Peter that Jesus is the Messiah, God's voice is that this is my son. Uh, amazing moments. And in, 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 a, in a flash, it's all over. I look up and everything's normal again. Jesus comes and he touches Peter on the shoulder. He says, don't be afraid. Because every time he reveals himself in a new way, whether it's walking on the water or raising someone from the dead, uh, he tends to terrify people. You know, you have to understand when you're with someone who keeps saying, don't be afraid, there's something about him uh, that makes you fearful. So don't be afraid. But so, so important to understand that first comes the confession. And then if you want the proof. A little later on, we'll be standing before the cross in Mark. And the priests will look up at Jesus on the cross and say, come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. See, they don't understand that it has to be the other way around, that belief has to come before seeing. Otherwise, it's not faith. in Capernaum, the third century synagogue, not the one that Jesus would have known, but uh, impressive all the same. What's really impressive is, is right here behind these walls. And if, if we are certain about any archeological site in Christendom, it's this one. Uh, you can see the octagonal walls, two series of them. But beneath those, you can see those black basalt boulders. Those were the walls of Peter's house. I mean, as, as certain as we can be of any archeological site. Um, when this was uh, excavated, um, the plaster uh, contained inscriptions about Peter and Jesus. Um, uh, the fact that uh, early in the uh, second century, this was revered as a holy site. I mean, all the evidence is, is there that this was actually Peter's house. 
Peter, the source of Mark's gospel. So much happened in this house. Uh, uh, the, the hole that was ripped in the roof, that was the roof of this house. Uh, people were trying to get to Jesus as, as he was uh, being covered up. Now remember that the Gospel of Mark also presents the emotional life of, of Jesus. And only in the Gospel of Mark do we actually see Jesus holding children in his arms. The other Gospels talk about children sort of in his proximity. But only Mark shows us twice in chapter 9 and chapter 10, Jesus actually holding children in his arms. And the first of those events took, took place here. They would come back from Capernaum. It's their last time before they leave to go to Jerusalem. Uh, some of them never to, to, never to return. And along the way, this, this argument that, that, that they, they couldn't seem to escape, this argument about who was the greatest, it was still, they were still arguing. In fact, they argued about it all the way to Jerusalem. So they come to Capernaum and Jesus asks, you know, what were you arguing about? And they're afraid uh, to tell him that they were arguing about who was the greatest. So in the confines of this little house, uh, Jesus takes a child. I think it was probably one of Peter's children. And Mark gives us the detail that he actually, he holds this child in his arms. And that child becomes the paradigm. If you want to become great, Jesus says, become like one of these children. It's, 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 the, it's the whole upside downness of the kingdom. So that's the first time Jesus takes a child in his arm. The only other time in Mark is chapter 10. And it's fascinating to me, after a long discussion on divorce, after people are talking about how, you know, how can we put our wives away, what's permissible, what's not permissible. In the context of divorce, of divorce, Jesus takes these little children once more in chapter 10 and holds them in his arms. Whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. We're here overlooking the oldest city in the world, Jericho, right below us. It was the city of priests. It was known as the city of priests. It was the city of, of the palms, the palm branches uh, that they waved in front of Jesus as he entered Jerusalem were cut down there and the pilgrims brought them up the hill. It's the last stop on your way uh, to Jerusalem when you're coming from the direction of Galilee. Now there, and I'm gonna say something hugely exaggerated and way over the top, but there Jesus meets the disciple he's been looking for for three years. Uh, and let me unpack that a little bit. Right before this passage, uh, Jesus encounters the rich young ruler and it's, he seems to be such a great prospect. I mean, he's rich, he's asking questions. They're not the right questions, but he's asking questions. And Jesus even invites him to become a follower but it all falls apart, right? Because he's not willing to sell everything and give it to the poor. Then Jesus comes through Jericho on his way. This is his last trip to Jerusalem. He's on his way to the cross. And as he's passing through the city, going out on the other side, he meets the perfect disciple. I call him the Jewel. His name's Bartimaeus. Uh, Mark knows his name. Bartimaeus is waiting. He's the perfect prospect. He's blind. He's poor. He's the only person in the gospel who calls Jesus, Jesus. He's the only person who calls Jesus by name. When Jesus calls him, he leaves everything. The only thing he has is his coat. And Mark gives us the detail that he jumps up, he leaves his coat behind him. And when he comes to Jesus, he's asking for what he knows he doesn't deserve. And that, that's a prerequisite if you're going to become a disciple. He's asking for mercy, something that he doesn't deserve. When he finally stands in front of Jesus and Jesus says, what do you want? They're, they're the words we've been waiting for the whole gospel from some disciple's mouth. He says, I want to see. I want to see. And Jesus heals him, not by any big dramatic uh, laying on of hands or spitting or none of the stuff that we saw earlier on this trip to Jerusalem. Jesus heals him, I think significantly, simply by saying, go. And Bartimaeus becomes a follower. He, he's healed. He can see. He becomes a follower of Jesus. And Mark tells us he follows him to Jerusalem where that cross is waiting for Jesus. Now the next day, when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, 
he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, Let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it, so they came to Jerusalem. At last, that long journey is done, that long journey down from Galilee. And they arrive here, here to Jerusalem. There it is, up on the hill. Jesus enters the city through that double arch gate. That's called the Golden Gate. Now that's not actually the one he went through, that's 16th century. But the one that Jesus entered through is, is there. It's underneath the ground. So this is a good, a good place for you to imagine Jesus going across the Kidron Valley, up that hill, and through that gate. Now Mark tells us he goes in and he looks around, but then he leaves again. He goes back to Bethany, where I'm assuming he's staying with uh, Lazarus, staying at their house. The next morning, they leave and they come back, same, same trail, back into the temple. And they pass a fig tree. Now it's, it's Passover, the month of Nisan, which is April to March. The trees have just began to leaf out and Jesus passes a fig tree. And he goes over, over to it looking for fruit and finds none. And then he does something very mysterious. No, there's nothing like this uh, in the gospel. He curses the fig tree. Now, it's not the time for figs. Figs don't come out till, till June. And Jesus knows this and Mark knows this because there's a little statement, a parenthetical statement in the text that says it wasn't the time for figs. Jesus knows this. So this is a mystery, but it's fascinating to me how in the Bible, one mystery will help us to understand another mystery. And this is Mark's bookend again. He's using a bookend device. So Jesus goes into the temple. Uh, on the way in, he curses the tree. What's the very next thing he does? He goes up into the temple area. Immediately, he starts turning the tables over. He starts running people out of there. And that's really another mystery. Scholars are still trying to figure out why he did it. So he leaves the temple, very emotional. This is the Gospel of Mark, the emotional life of Jesus, a very emotional moment. He leaves, goes back across the valley, back to Bethany. Next morning, they're coming back into the city. This is Passion Week. He's coming and going all week. They go back into the city. They pass that same fig tree, and it looks like this. Now, this isn't a fig tree, but use your imagination. It, it's completely withered up. And Peter is just amazed. Of course, it's the Gospel of Mark, so it's going to be Peter speaking. He is amazed that Jesus was able to do this. So that's, that's the other end of the bookend. A cursed tree with no fruit but green leaves. And in the middle, this mysterious tearing up of the temple. I call it the lesson of the leaves because the temple destruction is all about uh, the fruitless fig tree. It's, it's a parable again. It's, an, it's a moment that's a real parable. Jesus goes into a temple that seems fruitful. It's busy, it's prosperous, there's people exchanging money, just like that green fig tree. But Jesus is so emotionally upset that there's no fruit coming from that temple. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came, having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. Jesus and his disciples had been coming and going from Jerusalem, which is just over the hill, to Bethany, and that's where we are now, the city of Lazarus, coming and going. I believe he's staying in Lazarus' house, but uh, Mark doesn't say that for certain. At one point he comes back in chapter 14, he comes back and um, they have a party for him. John tells us that a party was, uh, was given in Jesus' honor, and I love the idea that someone had the good sense to throw him a party. Now Mark tells us it happens at the home of someone with the unfortunate name of Simon the leper. Uh, 
I tend to believe that was perhaps one of uh, Lazarus' brothers or maybe his father, but we know that Lazarus is there. We know that Martha is there uh, serving, which is what she always does. At some point in the meal, Mary comes in and she has an alabaster jar that's full of, full of perfume. Now, you've got to realize this isn't any kind of perfume that you and I uh, understand. This is nard. It comes from the foothills of the Himalayas. It's a, it's a family inheritance. Her grandmother gave it to her mother. Her mother gave it to her. This is probably the most precious thing she has. And she pours it on Jesus' head. Now, understandably, the disciples are upset. This is a tremendous waste as far as they're concerned. And Jesus, who breathes the Old Testament, uh, quotes Deuteronomy 15. You're going to always have the poor with you, but you're not always going to have me. And he says that Mary has done something that I don't think she understood she was doing. She was anointing Jesus for his burial. You can imagine the hush falling over the room. And then Jesus says something completely unique. It's, it's, there's nothing remotely like it any place else in the Gospels, and so we should really listen. Jesus memorializes what she does. He, he includes her story now as a part of his story. He says, from this point on, Whenever the gospel is preached, what she has done is going to be told as a memorial to her. It's, it's amazing. Remember, we always read scriptures in, in big blocks, whole chapters, whole books, whole blocks of books. And I'm convinced that you can't understand this story unless you understand the first time Jesus was in their home. And that's only in Luke. That's Luke 10. Where was Mary then? She was at his feet. And remember, Martha scolded her for, for not helping in the kitchen. And Jesus said another remarkable thing. He says, it's better for a woman to sit at my feet and study than it is to work in the kitchen, which is amazing. And I'm convinced that we would have never had this anointing in Bethany if we hadn't had that first incident. You've got to ask yourself the question, what kind of things do people do who've been sitting at the feet of Jesus? They do remarkable things like Mary did when she anointed him. They do things that become a part of Jesus' story. It's the Kidron Valley, the ancient walls of Jerusalem, the valley that Jesus would have crisscrossed all during Passion Week, uh, staying in the city during the day, teaching in the temple, crossing back over to Bethany or to Gethsemane where they would spend the night. But it's also part of the way of the cross because he's, he's arrested in Gethsemane and taken back into the city. Now when Mark tells us the story of the crucifixion of Jesus, he gives an interesting detail. He, he mentions a man named Simon of Cyrene in chapter 15. And in a little parenthesis, he says he's the father of Rufus and Alexander, which when you read that, it, it sort of sticks out like a sore thumb until you read Romans, the letter to the Romans. And in Romans 16, Paul greets Rufus. So there's a good chance that Simon, who carried the cross, helped carry the cross for Jesus, has a, a son who becomes a Christian who's part of the Roman church. It's a wonderful connection. That's really the only way to explain why Mark would greet, you know, this uh, father of uh, Rufus and Alexander. Jesus is taken to Golgotha and he's placed on the cross. All of the gospels simply say, there they crucified him, no details of the crucifixion. But then Mark tells us that the taunting begins. And there are three, three taunts, basically. They, they, they ridicule Jesus who said, you who you know, tore, said you could tear down the temple and raise it up in three days. That's a, that's a charge that goes all the way back to the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. The first time early in the Gospel of John where he said, tear this temple down and I'll raise it up. That was a, that was a taunt that uh, actually was part of Stephen even being stoned later on. So you who tore down the temple and said you could raise it up in three days. And another one of the taunts is he saved others, so let him save himself. They don't understand that he saves others precisely by not saving himself. But then for me, one of the most interesting taunts comes from the chief priests. And they say, you know, you're, if you're the Messiah, if you're the King of Israel, come down from the cross so that we may, can, so that we may see 
and believe. And we talked all along in the Gospel of Mark how it's always believing first and seeing. But those people who are there before that cross, they've got it all backwards. Demonstrate your power. You know, give us the proof so then we can see and believe. Well, then the darkness descends. This three hours of darkness that, that Amos says is like the darkness of morning for an only son. Exodus 10 says the darkness can be felt, the darkness of the plague uh, that, that Passover celebrates, the deliverance of Passover celebrates. It's a darkness that can be felt. I think it's that same darkness that surrounds the cross of Jesus. He makes a loud cry and he dismisses his spirit. And at that point, two events happen. And they're linked. And I don't know if you've ever seen that they are linked. Mark tells us that as Jesus cries out, this large curtain in the temple is torn from top to bottom. This indication that now God no longer is, is hidden behind this curtain, that the Spirit sort of is going to go out into everyone. But at the moment that that temple curtain is torn, a few hundred yards away, a Gentile Roman centurion He's part of the Italian League. They're, they're, they're uh, stationed in Israel uh, at this time in history. This Roman centurion says something incredible. He sees the way Jesus dies and perhaps, again, linked to this idea that the, the, the curtain has been torn. He says, surely this man is the Son of God. Mark's Roman re readers get to hear an Italian Roman centurion declare at the foot of the cross that surely this man was the Son of God. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. We've come to the end of the Gospel of Mark the end of our time together. And uh, it, it, it means a lot to me that our, our last scene is here. This is my favorite place in all of Jerusalem. It's a, it's a tomb behind the King David Hotel. This is a first century tomb and uh, no one's ever here. I love this place. But the Gospel of Mark ends very abruptly and we've come to expect that from Mark, right? The women are coming to the tomb with spices to anoint a dead body. No one's standing outside of the tomb waiting to see if Jesus is going to be raised from the dead, as he said. They come to anoint a dead body. In fact, what they're talking about, Mark says, is this stone. Look how enormous this stone is. The women are walking along saying, who is going to move the stone for us? And you can see why they'd be worried. But they shouldn't have worried, because when they get there, the stone's been rolled away. Look down in, all the resurrection appearances talk about this. They, they look down into the tomb and you can see, see this uh, very clearly here. And there's a young man who tells them he's not here. He says, go tell the disciples and Peter, and only Mark has that detail. Go tell the disciples and Peter. Now this is a very abrupt ending in Mark, and there's a little bit of controversy. Let me just talk about it for a second. Uh, most of your Bibles are going to have from verses 9 to 20, and there's this um, big debate that rages about that, but I've studied it and people I trust have studied it. Um, the, the earliest Greek manuscripts don't have 9 to 20. Uh, none of the early fathers ever refer to nine, for the verses 9 to 20. Um, Eusebius, the first church historian in the fourth century says accurate copies of Mark do not contain 9 to 20. So I, I've come to believe that Mark ends at verse 8 with this abruptness, but that's what we've come to expect from Mark, right? It's always abrupt. And he's always demanding that we believe before we see. We've seen that all along. Uh, he, he whispers to Jairus, fa to, to Jairus, the father of the young girl who's sick, you know, don't, don't be afraid, believe. He says that before he heals his daughter. Uh, he says that to the frightened father who says, you know, I believe, help my unbelief. Um, and Peter, Peter makes the confession. He believes before the proof of the transfiguration. It's always believing before seeing. 
Unlike as we saw before the cross, the mob is, is shouting at Jesus, come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. That's, that's not how it works. And Mark is very, very interested in that. So that's why the end of Mark is so abrupt, because he wants to leave us in precisely that place. We don't see Jesus at the end of Mark. We're, we're left with three women who are afraid and who are running from the tomb. Mark wants you to be in that place where you believe before you see, and this is so important. But let me, let me close with Peter's words because we believe the Gospel of Mark is the testimony of Peter, and I hope this will all make sense to you. This is Peter, 1 Peter 1.8. You love him, though you have not seen him, and though not seeing him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an inexpressible and glorious joy. That's where we're left in the Gospel of Mark, and that's where we want to leave you in this program. Mm -hmm.